afternoon. Thanks a lot for the thanks a lot for the invitation and for the possibility to give me voice and to present uh, uh, this study. This is a preliminary results of our uh, national grant that is focused on idiopathic infantile hypercalcemia. Uh, so during my presentation I would like to show you a little bit of history that, uh, uh, that is focused on uh, the rickets, majority nutritional rickets. Uh, and then I will go through, uh, through the major idea of this presentation and major idea of this uh, national grant. So as we all know, uh, uh, the industrial revolution that started in the 19th century uh, uh, has led to the increased prevalence of nutritional rickets. So families lived uh, at crowded and polluted area due to the fact that the coal was uh, extremely highly used as a, as a fuel. And uh, uh, the incidence, the prevalence of nutritional rickets was as high as 40 to 60 percent. And I would like to highlight the name of Jędrzej Śniadecki. He was a, a Polish uh, physician that lived in Vilnius in Lithuania. And he was the first who, who, who found the relationship between, uh, between the uh, sun exposure and nutritional rickets risk. So a century later, in the, in the 20th century, rickets were, were highly prevalent across the whole world. Uh, the prevalence was as high as 50 to 100 percent in children living in uh, European cities, or 75 percent in children uh, uh, living in New York. In the 30s, uh, 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 after the discovery of vitamin D, vitamin D. Uh, food forti fortification was introduced, so it led to near complete eradication of nutritional rickets. During the Second World War, uh, at least in the United Kingdom, there was a welfare food service, so the food was massively fortified with vitamin D, and those products were uh, free of charge for, for kids. So the consequence uh, was that. Uh, in the 50s, some endemics appeared of uh, hypercalcemia, of idiopathic hypercalcemia. There was also two other endemics that are uh, well evidenced in the literature, one in Poland and one in the uh, 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 German Democratic Republic. So, coming back to the United Kingdom, so those kids, those infants were exposed to such doses as 4,000 units daily or up to 35,000 units of vitamin D3 from all sources. So in the 50s there was 216 cases with hypercalcemia. And I would like to show it. Uh, sorry. Uh, so, uh, so the British Pediatric Association asked the government to stop uh, fortification of the milk and later on in the in the 60s, early 60s, only 50 cases were, uh, were noted with hypercalcemia. Our Polish experience was noted in the 80s. Uh, uh, we had almost 60 cases identified with idiopathic hypercalcemia and then almost 20 cases in 85, 1985. And this was most likely due to the fact that at that time in Poland, uh, infants were exposed to doses of 2,500 up to 4,000 units daily, or they were injected with uh, uh, 300,000 units as a loading dose. So you can find here a list of publications mainly, mainly done by Professor, uh, Professor Ewa Planicka from our institute. Uh, uh, and uh, when we are talking about the uh, the, 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 the supplementation of vitamin D for a general population, we should always remember that there are some cases, that there are some cases with, uh, uh, with vitamin D hypersensitivity. So we should always weigh benefits versus risks, as shown on this slide. Fortunately, we do have uh, uh, novel recommendations uh, that are uh, 
that are available, at least in the internet. Uh, so at those documents we can find an upper limit value, so recommended values for a general population that are considered as safe. Uh, for example, uh, uh, 400 units for newborns. This, those daily <coughs> doses considered as safe, as safe. But please remember about, about those infants who may be hypersensitive for vitamin E. So what are the diagnostic criteria? These are typical criteria for hypercalcemia, so it's a failure, failure to treat, polyuria, dehydration, etc. Uh, laboratory findings, of course, at the manifestations the calcium levels are, are markedly increased, but at the follow-up they are normal or, uh, uh, normal or a little bit increased. PTH activity is at both at manifestation and at, at the follow-up uh, uh, is not active, it's inactive, and the concentration is extremely low. The 25 OHD as well as 125 OHD are maybe increased or maybe normal. And of course there is a uh, hypercalciuria that may lead to nephrocalcinosis. And here is the slide that's showing a uh, clinical and laboratory course of a patient suffering from neopathic infantile hypercalcemia who, with, uh, with a cure showing serum calcium levels, uh, PTH activity, and uh, calciuria. Uh, and this patient was treated with the use of pamidronate three times, and still cal calcemia was high. PTH was inactive and uh, the uh, uh, calciuria was increased, leading to nephrocalcinosis, as shown on this picture. The treatment is typical for uh, hypercalcemic crisis, so it is rehydration, furosemide, glucocorticosteroids, uh, bisphosphonates, ketoconazole, but what is more important, at least from the perspective of a, of a grant, uh, results I will show in the future, in the near future. It's the long-term treatment, long-term suggestions how to, uh, uh, how to, how to avoid uh, 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 risk related to hypercalcemia. So the major suggestion is to omit all sources of vitamin D, omit the uh, uh, calcium <coughs> sources and omit natural sources uh, such, as, uh, such as sun exposure of our skin. Sources of vitamin D. <clears throat> so, as I told you, in the 50s there was an, an endemic of uh, idiopathic hypercalcemia in the United Kingdom. Now, there were uh, more than 200 cases, it was 216 cases, but in the United States there was only 20, case, 20 cases evidenced. Most likely due to the fact that the, that the recommended dose was uh, uh, pretty much lower in uh, North America compared to United Kingdom. Uh, the second cohort, uh, evidenced cohort of uh, and endemics of uh, idiopathic hypercalcemia was, was noted in the uh, German Democratic Republic. Those infants and uh, newborns were exposed to oral doses of 600,000 units given five times during the first two years of life. So I think it's a, a pretty high uh, doses of vitamin D. And our, our experience, our Polish experience, so most infants became symptomatic during the mid-80s with the supplementation of 25 <coughs> Uh, 100 up to 4,000 units daily, or as an effect of uh, giving of a loading dose of 300,000 units every three months during the first year of life. Of life. So, uh, so scientists started started to look for uh, for for candidate genes. And uh, uh, it appeared that the, uh, the, the idiopathic hypercalcemia is related to the mutation of 24-hydroxylase, an enzyme responsible for a catabolic arm of, uh, uh, of, of this metabolic, vitamin D metabolic pathway. 
uh, what are the uh, biochem biochemical characteristics of this disease? It's of course the calcium, yeah, calcium levels, cal uh, calcium levels are significantly increased. PTH activity uh, is uh, very low. Uh, uh, 125 OHD may be normal or slightly increased. The same with 25. Uh, that may be normal or increased. But what is the uh, major sign of this disease is uh, extremely low 24-25 OHD concentrations and the uh, extremely increased ratio, as, as Professor Winkley showed us before. So this ratio between 25 OHD and 24-25 OHD is uh, uh, at cases suffering from idiopathic hypercalcemia extremely increased. So, uh, because we had ex our hospital, our institute had uh, experience with those cases, so we searched for uh, we searched our database that is 35 years old. <coughs> uh, so we have, we looked for those cases with uh, mm, with uh, uh, hypercalcemia, and we decided to. Uh, to do uh, a grant focused on this issue. We hypothesized that idiopathic infantile hypercalcemia does induce strong negative long-term renal vascular and bone consequences after infancy and that the reduction of vitamin D and calcium supplementation and UV exposure among people with vitamin D high hypersensitivity may, may cause bone mineralization abnormalities. So we, we searched, as I told you, we searched our database and we found 74 adults uh, who were uh, during the childhood, uh, who were our patients. And we used next generation sequencing and other methods. Uh, but first, I would like to show the, the, the part one, uh, the, the, the first results that are already published in general applied genetics. So we have found 11 cases, young adults, uh, with, var with pathogenic variants of two gene studies. So we have uh, found nine patients with C24A1 mutations and two, only two patients with uh, SLC34A1 gene mutation that, is that, that gene is related to the FGF23 and CLOTO activities. Uh, it is responsible for the phosphaturia, phosphatemia. So, uh, take a look. Oh, it's a, it's a busy table, but we can note that those subjects with C24 had normal or increased calcemic, calcemic values. Uh, 25 OHD were normal, but, but, but in some cases that were, they, they were relatively increased, up to 100 nanograms. And, uh, and uh, 125 OHD was uh, slightly increased compared to our uh, lab uh, reference values. At the second part of our, of our grant, we decided to look, for, uh, to look for more sophisticated characteristics of uh, of a part of uh, meta vitamin D metabolome. We searched for concentrations of 25 uh, D3, D2, 3 AP25, D3, 24, 25, and 125 D3 using calcium SMS as well as standard methods. We we take care, we, we take a look at the bond and norvar markers, um, and of course we did uh, densitometry with uh, DEXA and PQCT methods and other mechanographic methods. We tested the kidney function, vascular structure and function. We also take a look at the microRNA 125, but uh, I'm sorry I cannot show this results because these, these are under embargo, but what, I, uh, what I'm sure I can show you is that results I was uh, in charge of. So these are the total number of 15 cases with confirmed C24A1 mutations. These assays were performed in young adults in, uh, a year ago. So the serum calcium at the, uh, 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 in these cases were, were normal or slightly increased. 
PTH activity was in some cases suppressed, but in other some 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 concentrations appeared. Three uh, IP values 25 OHD3, 25 OHD3 appeared in majority of cases. Uh, slightly increased, it was higher than 50, but some cases had normal 25 OHD. Uh, 24, 25 OHD was extremely low except one case. Uh, and so the ratio of 25 to, 20, uh, 25 to 24, 25 was extremely high except one case. Uh, the, among those, those cases, five cases uh, uh, revealed nephrocalcinosis, and this, uh, these are uh, biochemistry of those. Cases with nephrocalcinosis, again, calcemia normal or, or a little bit increased, uh, PTH activity low, uh, 25 OHD uh, in some cases normal, but in general slightly above the upper reference, uh, 24, 25 concentrations extremely low, and the ratio extremely high. And here's the, uh, here, here we can find the VEXA Z scores of those cases. We can see that the, uh, the, the long term avoidance of calcium, long term avoidance of uh, uh, vitamin D, long term avoidance of uh, sun as a natural source of vitamin D. Uh, uh, all of them have not led to, uh, to uh, bone mineral disturbances. Uh, DEXA Z, Z score values assessed for total body bone mineral density, uh, lumbar spine bone mineral density were pretty much normal. Lean body mass as a measure of uh, muscle mass or fat mass were also not changed. Uh, the same, the same character. The same characteristics uh, done in five cases with nephrocalcinosis, again, results of bone mineral density as of a whole skeleton and lumbar spine normal, in body mass normal, fat mass as normal. So how about the more sophisticated analysis performed by, by, uh, uh, by measurements of volumetric bone mineral density, bone geometry, bone strength, and again, Trabecular density, total density, <laughs> as well as geometry, cortical density, as, and bone strength, as well as by strength, strength index. All of those measure, measures of uh, bone mass, bone density, bone quality, bone geometry, not change, not different compared to the uh, reference. Muscle area normal. Fat area, stripes, fat area assessed uh, by PQCT uh, slightly increased, but it is still uh, close to zero. And slightly abnormal proportion between fat and muscle mass. But uh, despite that those values were uh, significantly different from the zero, uh, I'm not sure whether this, uh, these results show any cl are clinically meaningful. I doubt about, about this. So, to summarize primary, pre preliminary results, young adults with confirmed C24A1 gene mutations may reveal normal calcemia or hypercalcemia, most likely depending on the compliance to restrictions related to diet supplement use, restrictions, and sun avoidance. They have tendency to su suppress PTH, they have had normal or increased 25, normal or increased 125, extremely low 24, 25, and extremely high ratio values. Bone mass, bone density, bone strength, and other markers of uh, skeletal status, muscle status, and fat status are normal, but some cases are at risk of nephrocalcinosis. So, CYP24 mutations cause majority of true uh, idiopathic hypocalcemia. CYP24A1 mutations mostly result in a complete loss of function of this enzyme. Uh, 125 may, uh, are often increased, but may be normal. Uh, 24 hydroxylated metabolites are low in, uh, in cases suffering from uh, idiopathic infantile hypercalcemia. But what is for the pediatricians? I think I will not go through all of this conclusion, but, but 
what is important from my perspective is that we should be on look out for hypercalcemic individuals who might be hypersensitive to vitamin D. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very interesting presentation. The next presentation